welcome back we were talking about expected utility theory and i ended with uh, with the uh, with its main uh, with its main premise which is that one has a way of comparing comparing outcomes uh, comparing probability distributions or lotteries on outcomes and it what uh, and it uh, the presumption was that if you had this then you then this was actually encoded in terms of a utility function the expected utility uh, and what one had to do was look at the expected ut uh, utility of the outcome under a particular decision and look for the decision that maximizes this expected utility right so let us let's actually fructify this in terms of an example let's look at this more concretely in terms of an example so here is an example from uh, an investment example so the the problem here is of allocating our capital we have a capital of we have a capital of of say you know just 1 dollar for uh, for simplicity cap we have a capital of 1 dollar and we have two inv investment alternatives two investment alternatives let's call these alternatives a and b okay now the investment uh, option a what option a does is option a yields alternative a gives you for every dollar 1 dollar that you invest it actually gives you 1.5 dollars with certainty okay so the outcome that it results is that is only one particular outcome it gives you 1.5 dollars with certainty now alternative b has is actually probabilistic so out, uh, alternative b will give you with probability half it was going to give you 3 dollars 3 dollars with probability half and it is going to give you uh, 1 dollar also with probability half so with uh, with uh, with probability half it it will keep your investment the same it will keep it at uh, uh, it it will not erode your investment it, you will still get back one dollar your the one dollar that you invested and with probability half it will it will triple your investment on the other hand a is is guaranteed to give you 50% uh, to give you 50% return it will grow your investment to uh, to 1.5 dollars with certainty that it is guaranteed to do so now in our framework therefore what we need to decide is what fraction out of this 1 dollar should you invest in a and what fraction should you be investing in d in in b so the fraction let's call this fraction d okay d in the interval 0 1 is the fraction to be invested in a okay so therefore our decision then is the fraction that we are investing in in a the rest is going to be invested in in b the the set of decisions then is is this interval 0 to 1 okay so we have to book, uh, choose a decision from this set, from this set of decisions what is the set of outcomes that can arise well we can uh, we can see here the outcome can be anywhere from the range 1 to 1 to 3 depending on the fraction that we invest you could get all the way up to up if you invest all your money in 3 in in b and it turns out that you uh, that the, that the investment actually triples then uh, then in that case you would you would get you would get 3 dollars so if you put all the, the entire 1 dollar in in b then you would get three dollars if you put uh, if you uh, but then there is also a possibility that you will get only one dollar so depending on the fraction that you invest you could get any anything in the range from one to three so the outcome space o is this interval from one to three the actual outcome the actual outcome is a function of of the state uh, of of what actually comes out of of the investment in b 
whether whether this state of the world gets realized or that state of the world gets realized. So, this state of the world let us let us denote this one here by the this this state of the world here let us let me denote this by by omega 1 here and let let me denote this by omega 2. So, so the states of the world then is capital omega which is these two possibilities omega 1 and omega 2. So, the actual outcome then is is going to be f of d comma omega. So, if I invest a fraction d in, in a then I what then I am going to get 1.5 dollars times d from a because whatever fraction I invest for every dollar I invest it is going to give me 1.5 dollars. So, if I invest d uh, d, uh, d dollars or d fraction of, of 1 dollar I will get 1.5 d as the return uh, as uh, as my uh, as my return on it ok. Plus whatever the remaining is invested is invested in uh, is invested in in b. So, so the rest of this term is going to depend on which which state of the world gets realized. So, what we will do is we instead of writing it this way I will write this as follows. So, I will get 1.5 d plus 3 into 1 minus d. Now, why does why is this 3 into 1 minus d? Well, it is 3 into 1 minus d because I uh, will get 3 dollars for the 1 minus d that I have uh, dollars that I have invested in, in alternative b when omega 2 gets realized. Right. So, when omega 2 gets real, uh, sorry when omega 1 gets realized, when omega 1 gets realized. So, this will happen with probability half. Alternate in the other case when omega 2 gets realized I will get 1.5 d. Remember I still get the 1.5 d from, from, uh, from investment in A. So, I still get 1.5 d plus 1 minus d. This happens in scenario omega 2 and that happens with probability also happens with probability half ok. So, this is this is therefore the actual outcome that will get realized. So, so obviously this is a function of both the state of the na state of nature as well as the uh, as well as the decision or the fraction that you are going to invest ok. So, let us just look at a few numbers how this behaves. Now notice that the uh, if you if you see if you let us look at if one possible thing to do is again uh, although I have already pointed out the fallacy in it let us look at the average rate of return. What is the average what is the average rate of return in, in both of these investments? The on average B is going to give you is going to give you an average of of 3 and 1. So, on average B is actually going to give you 2 ok. So, if you put the entire 1 dollar in, in B on average you are going to get 2 dollars ok and on av and whereas A with certainty gives you 1.5 dollar if you put the entire 1 dollar in A. So, if you put the entire 1 dollar in, in B you would on average get more than what you would get in A. So, consequently you might think one, one may presume that well you would want to put all your money in B. But but if you ask most people, most people will not behave in this way. This is not how the, this is not really their attitude towards lotteries and towards towards uh, towards uncertainty and towards risk. So at the same time, if you look at uh, if you if you look at alternative A, now alternative A gives you 1.5 with certain uh, with with certainty, and that is better than the worst case outcome of B. So, the worst if you just think only of the worst case the worst thing that could happen if you put your money in B if you put any amount of money in B right. If you think of the worst that could happen the worst that could happen is act, uh, is that whatever money you put in B does not grow at all it uh, you know you put in you put in uh, an amount 1 minus D in B and it remains at 1 minus D. Okay. In, in which case you would have been better off putting all that money actually in A itself. So, the worst case the, the decision that, that maximizes your worst case that gives you the most money in the worst case 
is the is the decision to put all the money in A, right. So, to make this more concrete, so if one simply if if one looks at so the worst the way to think about the worst case was one looks at the worst possible scenario over all possible states of the world that could arise uh, of of this and you try you max you look at the decision that maximizes the worst case the or your return in the worst case now in the worst case this this actually you, you will see this is nothing but maximum over d in i'm just putting capital d as 0 1 so i'm replicating the terms from the previous thing so it's from the previous slide that is that these two terms these two terms here so one looks at this and when looks at the minimum out of these two which is 1 point minimum of 1.5 d plus 1 minus d and 1.5 d plus 3 times 1 minus d. The obviously if you compare these two it is clear that the first term here is this is the lesser of the two and then what we are doing therefore is maximizing uh, choosing the d that maximizes the first term and so that is nothing but and this what, what does this say well this says simply that one should put all one's money in uh, in alternative a. So, the maximum of this is 1.5 itself and that comes with d equal to d star equals equals 1. In other words the entire money should be invested in A right. So, so the, the worst case so the worst case outcome uh, if one looks at the worst case outcome the answer is invest everything in A. And if you if you look at only the average outcome, the answer is well that what that tells you is in invest only in B. Okay. So, what what expected utility theory is basically telling you is not do is to is to not do any of this. What it tells you is in fact what you should be looking at is the utility of the outcome and then find that value of d that maximizes the expected utility right. So, what the expect what expected utility theory instead tells you to do theory tells you to do is to is to maximize this the expected utility of of the now there are two possible two possible values uh, of omega so this expectation as i said this expectation is over omega and there are two possible values of omega and what they will result in is is those two expressions that we wrote on the previous slide. So, what you are doing therefore is maximizing. So, if I am just evaluating this expression I have prob the probability of so I have the probability of omega equal to omega 1 which is which is half and the utility that comes from omega equal to omega 1 in when omega is omega uh, omega 1 the outcome is 1.5 d plus 3 times 1 minus d. And, the, and so what I have is the utility of this particular outcome. So I have u of 1.5 d plus 3 times 1 minus d plus half again times u of 1.5 d plus 1 minus d. Right. So, what you expected utility theory is telling you is to choose a d that maximizes this function 
it is not tell it is not saying you look at the worst case, it is not saying you look at the average case or any of that. It just says look at this particular function. Okay. Now obviously the question arises where where are you going to get this function from? Okay. Is there and who is going to tell you this function? Uh, who is going to tell you this function u? So the important cons important most important uh, sort of contribution or result of expected utility theory is that there is in fact such a function. Once you have a preference ordering on, on the set of lotteries, uh, this there always exists such a function. Okay. And so this function is and is is it's to a large extent unique. There is uh, there is uh, there is a uh, you can say without almost uh, without loss of generality. There is a, this function is unique, and it is basically capturing for you a, or uh, your attitude that is that is encoded in the preference ordering that you have in the in on the set of lotteries. So now what we will, what we will do now before I get come to that that particular theorem which gives guarantees the existence of the utility uh, utility function. Let us actually do one example. Let us let us take one particular utility function and let us actually work this out work out what this what this this actually tells you. So what we will do is we will take u of u of o to be equal to say alpha o minus o square. Okay. So, so when an outcome o arises the utility that you get from that outcome is some is alpha o minus o square and where alpha is some scalar I will we can fix some is a scalar whose value we will fix. So the utility must have it has uh, needs to have a certain set of properties. So for example, we, we need for instance that the utility has to be increasing. So more money is gives us more utility. So the utility will, will be increasing. For all of this to hold what we will impose is that alpha is actually strictly greater than 6. So you can verify that when alpha is strictly greater than 6, u is actually increasing on, on the set of outcomes. on 1 to 3 on the space 1 to 3. Now what we will do is now we can now plug this utility in into this into this expression that we had into this particular expression and uh, uh, plugging in that particular uh, plugging that in we can then find the maximizing d. So it turns out that the optimal d star then the maximizing d star is some is takes this form uh, it uh, it 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 is 0 with if alpha is greater than equal to 8 and it is 8 minus alpha divided by 5 if alpha is between between 6 and 8. So if alpha is between 6 and 8, it is basically it, it, you notice that this term d star is actually uh, is, is neither 0 nor 1. So consequently what it is telling you is that one should not actually be investing the entire amount in A. So this is effectively what it is capturing uh, our, what our intuition about how one would make a decision in this kind of a matter. We would not put all your money in A nor would you want to put all your money in B. What you would want to do is divide it so that some amount is in A and so that you get your fixed return as well and some amount is in B so that you also get you get you get the benefit of, uh, of some additional returns that, uh, that, that are provided because of the probabilistic outcome of B. Right? So but you would not want to go to either extreme where, where you want to put everything in A or everything in B. So this is what it is get, what is getting captured for alpha between 6 and 8. When alpha is very uh, much uh, alpha is greater than 8 in that uh, in that case effective if you see what seems to be happening is that you know the function here is becomes more and more towards linear as alpha increases. So if, if the function is more and more towards linear effectively what, what this function is trying what it is what the utility is trying sort of trying to be, uh, suggest is, is for you to look at is to, is to ignore is to ignore the second term is to ignore the theta square term and look at only the first term. In which case you are boss, what you are effectively doing is look at looking at therefore the expected outcome itself. 
and as a result when alpha is greater than equal to 8 your your decision begins to more mimic the ex, what you would do if you were to only look at the expected outcome and when you were looking only looking at the expected outcome what were you doing well you were putting all your money in b right so so that's what's getting reflected in this so when alpha is greater than equal to 8 at that uh, for that value your d star is 0 so you don't put any money in a at all you put everything in b so your the your attitude towards risk is actually getting captured here by the shape of the utility function so when your alpha is when your alpha is large your utility function on the interval 1 to 3 tends to be a little more like a linear function for large alpha for alpha small it tends to be a little more like a function like this so the shape of this utility function is capturing the way the the is is sort of encoding in it your attitude towards risk okay so if your if your alpha is large your your you tend to behave more like your utility function behaves almost like a linear function and then therefore uh, and therefore it it only emphasizes for it for you the first moment of of the, uh, the first moment of the outcome which is therefore the mean of the outcome right so so the so here here here's here's one key this is actually a fairly interesting point when alpha is when uh, when when only the first moment is mattering the first moment is mattering only when alpha becomes large and al when alpha becomes large your utility becomes almost linear in general though all moments of the utility will matter in this case the utility is is quadratic so so both moments the first and the second moment would matter if if this utility was some uh, was not quadratic but say some other co uh, concave increasing function then then pro potentially any all the all the moments would begin to of the uncertainty of of the outcome would begin to matter so essentially so if you have a general utility function uh, which is which is uh, you know quad, uh, con, uh, which is concave differentiable and so on concave and differentiable the maximizing d would have in, in it the role of all the moments of uncertainty so all moments of the outcome would in general matter right so for example you can take say for a, a utility for example which is e to the minus minus lambda times theta lambda times o 1 minus e to the minus lambda times o this this sort of a function is has this this sort of shape and we can see when we expand the uh, expand the exponential you can see that every it actually expands as as a power series of uh, as a power series in theta uh, uh, and and in in that case all it's not just uh, it's not just theta theta or theta uh, it's not just theta square but theta cube theta raised to 4 etc etc so essentially every possible moment of the outcome has a role to play so when the utility is linear you are uh, it's you only care about the first moment so this intuition what this is also telling you is that this uh, the this this particular attitude of looking at only the average outcome is is essentially born out of an underlying thinking uh, underlying assumption uh, or, or a mental attitude of having a u, a linear utility where you only care about where you have where your utility just scales linearly with the outcome but in general one would actually have a much more nuanced uh, uh, gradation or new, uh, and a tapering off of the utility and that is and if you want to capture all of that you one would have to look at also the other moments of the uh, other moments of the outcome okay so with this now let me uh, i will just quickly end with by telling you the theorem under which there always exists uh, such a utility function and that theorem is uh, is is the is the is as follows what we will do is we will make we will make the following assumptions so 
So, we are going to make the following assumptions you note cap this fancy P the set of as the set of all lotteries it is the set of all lotteries it equivalently the set of all prob possible probability distributions uh, on outcomes ok. And if I gave you two probability distributions P1 comma P2 in P ok and suppose my set of outcomes let me denote this as as 1 O2 dot 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 O n. So, if I have uh, n so that I have n possible outcomes and I gave you two probability this two lotteries P1 and P2 when I if I have to if by alpha P1 plus 1 minus alpha P2 what I mean is the lottery that gives probability uh, under this. So, this is now a new lottery new lottery ok. So, this is also a, uh, a lot this is also a probability distribution on O and if you look at any any if you want to ask what is the probability that it assigns to an outcome say O j the, uh, the probability that it assigns is going to be alpha times P 1 of O j plus 1 minus alpha times P 2 of O j ok. So, this is basically uh, and this is true for all j from 1 to n. So, in other words uh, in other words when if you take a convex combination of of two lotteries here alpha is in 0 comma 1. So, when you take a mixture of these two lotteries so you have alpha times P 1 plus 1 minus alpha times P 2 what you get is a new lottery in which the probabilities are, are added up in the proportion alpha and 1 minus alpha. So, you take a weighted sum of the probabilities that you would get from the erstwhile lotteries P 1 and P 2 ok. So, you can also interpret alpha times P 1 plus 1 minus alpha times P 2 as a lottery on the set of lotteries it is as if you are you are tossing another coin it gives you with probability alpha it gives you a lottery P 1 and probability 1 minus alpha it gives you a lottery P 2 ok. So, you uh, that is another way of interpreting this ok. So, with this we can now state our assumptions ok. So, assumption so the first assumption is the following there uh, assumption is that there exists a complete and transitive relation on the set of lotteries ok. So, which means that means for any P 1 P 2 in this set of lotteries we have either P 1 less than equal to P 2 in uh, in under this preference relation or P 2 less than equal to P 1. We will also say that P 1 tilde P 2 or P 1 is equivalent to P 2 if both of these is true if P 1 is less than equal to P 2 and P 2 is less than equal to P 1. And we will use the uh, notation that P 1 is strictly less than P 2 if P 1 is, is less than equal to P 2, but not P 1 is not tilde P 2 ok. In, so, this is so this is like a so one should think of uh, this relation in the following way you uh, the less than e the this less this is like a less than equal to this is like an equal to and this is like a strict less than uh, strict less than sign ok. So, the uh, first assumption here assumption A 1 says that there exists such a relation there exists such a complete and transitive relation. Now, assumption A 2 
says that if P1 is equivalent to P uh, to P2 then for all alpha in 0 1 and all P in in P alpha P1 plus 1 minus alpha P2 is equivalent uh, 1 minus alpha P is equivalent to alpha P2 plus 1 minus alpha P. So, what this is saying is that if P1 and P2 are equivalent then you can mix them in the same proportion with the third lottery P and the mixed lotteries would also be equivalent right. So, the mixed lotteries here are alpha P1 plus 1 minus alpha P and alpha P2 plus 1 minus alpha P. So, they, they would also be equivalent. The third assumption is if P1 is strictly less than P2 then for all alpha in 0 1 and all P in in P you can so if P1 is if P2 is strictly preferred to P1 then you can mix any other lottery with with P uh, with P1 uh, and similar and in the same proportion mix another uh, mix it with uh, with uh, with P2 as well and the preference order would remain the same. And the fourth assumption is if P1 is strictly less than P2 is strictly less than P3 then there exists an alpha in 0 and 1 such that alpha P1 plus 1 minus alpha P3 is equivalent to P2. So, that means if you have 3 lotteries P1, P2, P3 and there is a strict preference like this P1 is P3 is more preferred to P2, P2 is more preferred to P1 then you can mix P1 and P3 in a suitable proportion alpha so that that becomes equivalent to equivalent to lottery P2. So, what these 4 axioms you can see are very reasonable axioms they are basically saying that you have some way of, of ordering ordering lotteries such that they uh, there is uh, f such that the order is complete such that you know there is a certain uh, these kind of mixing rules apply that if you if you mix with if you mix p1 with p and p2 with p in a cer uh, in certain ways then the order remains the same or if they are equivalent the equivalence is retained and you if you if you if you have an ordering between three lotteries p1 p2 p3 then also you can do some mixing and uh, and and recover the intermediate lottery now the theorem then is sim says simply this so under assumptions under assumptions a1 to a4 there exists a real valued function u that maps outcomes to the reals called the utility function such that for all lotteries P1, P2 in the set of lotteries P1 less than or equal to P2 is equivalent to the the expected utility of the outcome expected utility of the outcome under P1 is less than equal to the expected utility of the outcome under P2. Remember the outcome itself depends uh, uh, the probability with which various outcomes arise depend on 
on P1 uh, it depends on the distribution and we are on the left hand side I am, I am taking the distribution to be P1, right hand side I am taking the distribution to be P2. So, what this theorem is saying is that if these assumptions hold then there exists a, a utility function such that max such that comparing the expected value of that utility function uh, expected value of that utility function is equivalent to comparing the two lotteries. So, in other words if your set of preferences or if your set of lotteries has uh, satisfies this set of axioms then you are effectively what you are effectively doing is maximizing the expected utility with whether you like it or not there is implicitly underlying that a utility function which you are which you are maximizing. This is a landmark theorem because it really simplifies a lot of complicated matters like comparing lotteries and so on to a simple optimization question the one of maximizing the expected utility. It also gives you a lot of personalization because it tells you how different utilities uh, the shape and the form of different utilities are really captured eventually by the, by the preference underlying preference relation and not just by the probability the uh, uh, not just the set of outcomes. So, this is an uh, this therefore is going to be a cornerstone of our form problem formulations in this uh, in this course ok. I, I look forward to uh, look forward to teaching you more about this. Thank you. <laughs>